Thursday night were the duels at Daytona. Let's talk about them. Thursday night were the annual Gatorade duels at Daytona. I know there's a new sponsor. It doesn't matter. I'm calling it the Gatorade duels because that's what it's always been. Still the Bush series to me for crying out loud. Regardless, they had the duels on Thursday night. That sets the lineup for Sunday's Daytona 500. I'll be there. If you're going to be there, say hello. It'd be pretty nice or on Monday, but hopefully on Sunday. We're getting it in Sunday. Positive vibes only. So we had the qualifying races on Thursday night, duel number one and duel number two. Typically one duel is a little bit crazier than the other. And I would argue that both of them were pretty crazy on Thursday night. We learned a lot of things from this as well. The fact that Toyota definitely has a ton of speed. They swept both races, uh, sending both of their drivers to victory lane. And we learned that people are still going to push when it doesn't really matter. Ryan Blaney also has a ton of personality now, and he was incredibly pissed off after the race, and he had every right to be. We'll get into that in our duel number two conversation. But in duel number one, things started off pretty calm for the most part. You had Jimmy Johnson going and trying to qualify for the Daytona 500. He needed to lock himself in. He had to finish ahead of J.J. Yaley. J.J. Yaley, meanwhile, had to finish ahead of Jimmy Johnson, and it came down to this back and forth between the two of them. You have a growing powerhouse, essentially, in Legacy Motor Club uh, with Jimmy Johnson, their new Toyota partnership. They're essentially a tier one Toyota team now going up against New York Racing and the number 44 car that couldn't pay Greg Biffle. And they had to slap a piece of duct tape over the side of their hauler because Greg's like, hey, you never paid me. I'm definitely not driving this car this year. I mean, Chevrolet, their manufacturer doesn't even know they exist. They showed up in Daytona and Chevy's like, all right, we've got another car down here. I had no idea that they were coming. So you have J.J. Yaley versus Jimmy Johnson. Anthony Alfredo locked himself in on speed, and he kind of just dropped to the back because he and that number 62 car of Beard Motorsports, they wanted to protect their car. So that essentially made it really easy for J.J. Yaley to at least finish ahead of Alfredo. And then he needed to finish ahead of Jimmy Johnson. And they went back and forth, you know, trying to figure out who was going to get themselves in. And Jimmy said on the last lap, essentially, he was going through his head about all the partners he was going to have to call, how he's going to be in the suite on Sunday, shaking hands and apologizing for not being in the 500. And then everything stacked up coming to the start finish line. And Jimmy was able to get ahead of JJ Yealy and steal that last spot in the Daytona 500 from duel number one. Jimmy Johnson came home. 12th. Meanwhile, JJ Yaley came home 16th and everything stacked up there at the end. And that's what allowed Jimmy Johnson to get in. And he was losing his mind on the radio. He was yelling. He was swearing up and down. He was telling Eric Jones that he needed to drop back and pick up Jimmy Johnson and help get him up there. But Eric Jones, this race pays points. I think people forget that. And Eric Jones ended up coming home fifth. So he gets five points out of this race. They pay uh, through the top 10 in points. So he couldn't exactly just bail out. And then if he does, what happens if they both lose all their momentum and then they can't uh, come back up to the pack? So Jimmy made the right moves there at the end. Yaley took a huge run coming off of turn four and was hoping that, you know, that was going to try to stick for him. It did not. Nobody went with him. Jimmy was able to get past him, locks himself into the Daytona 500. He also spun out as well um, earlier in that race, probably with like 10 laps to go and a just stack up incident and then everything kind of accordion from there and spun him out it happens it, 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 unfortunate but it is what it is and then you have essentially Tyler Reddick almost had a catastrophic incident coming to pit road everything stacked up there kind of pinballed around and was able to drive out of it somehow saves it from that goes on to win the race he led exactly one lap and it was the lap that paid and then he was awkwardly standing around on the front stretch, still celebrating, kind of like trying to build up the excitement. And Regan Smith, it's just, I don't know where he was at. He's wandering around the infield, can't find his way to go. Like the old Michael Waltrip commercial. We're at the wrong track. I don't know where Regan was for the longest time. It took him forever to get there. And Tyler was just kind of awkwardly standing there with a the camera guy looking at him. But he wins the race after leading only one lap. Kyle Larson led the most laps in duel number one with 20. You also have Ricky Stenhouse Jr. leading 15 laps. Martin Truex Jr. leading 14 laps. We saw a good mix up there at the front. The Hendrick cars all seemed to work pretty well together until things got stacked up a little bit for them. And they were kind of got shuffled up and out of the way. And that's, you know, how Reddick ends up winning the race here. And it's a dual race. It doesn't matter at the end of the day. But the Toyotas looked very strong. Tyler Reddick started 19th. He wins the race. Jimmy Johnson started at the back as well. Well, essentially at the back, 18th, right one position ahead of Tyler Reddick. And he was in the top five in the first, I don't know, five to seven laps. He was up there very quickly. 
Toyotas have speed. That new Toyota Camry body definitely works really well on super speedways on these drafting tracks. They can push well, they can lead as well. So they might be a threat on Sunday. Moving on to duel number two though, this is where things got a little bit wild. And typically if there's one calm duel, you know, it's going to be a little bit crazy in duel number two. And typically duel number one is like BYU house party calm. You're like, ah, oh, it's a little crazy. It's not, it's not at all. And then you get to duel number two and you're like, this is exactly what I expect a house party to be like at every major college in the country that's not BYU. And things got crazy in duel number two. First off, what appears to be a new tradition in Daytona, a lot like cooking a turkey on Thanksgiving, is hooking Ryan Blaney in the right rear and turning him head onto the wall. I believe this is the third race in a row that's happened to him. And nobody likes it, nobody likes it but it keeps happening. And it just becomes this biannual tradition now for Ryan Blaney. And he got out of the car after the race and he was pissed. I didn't mean to hit the table there because the microphone's going to pick it up. He was furious and he has every right to be. He was mad that people were just shoving for no reason. Just bad pushes through the trioval once again. He's tired of people pushing in the corners. I listened to Jeff Gluck's uh, teardown podcast. I don't know why it's a Monday morning podcast like he's Bill Burr. He's not. I listened to his podcast and he couldn't understand why Blaney was mad. And it's like, well, I don't know, dude, because for the third race in a row at Daytona, he gets turned head on into the wall and he's pissed off about it because it hurts. Completely understand it. I understand, and then Gluck did clarify that he understands why he's mad, but he doesn't understand who he's mad at. And he's mad at everybody behind him, particularly Brad Keselowski, who's shoving people through the trioval in the corners. And once again, we know what's going to happen in these situations. You're going to usually end up turning the car and then hooking another car off into the wall. So he's pissed off about it. Completely understand that 100%. That set up an absolute massive crash, which collected a ton of people in it. You had... Ryan Blaney, Kyle Busch, Riley Herbst, Noah Gregson, Bubba Walls, BJ McLeod, uh, David Reagan, I think, went spending at one point. You had a ton of people getting spun out in this crash. And it's really unfortunate because it tore up a lot of race cars for Sunday. And a lot of people are going to have to go to backups. And that's another thing Blaney was pissed about is having to go to a backup car and not be able to take that car to the 500 now, which they were really happy with. So after that big crash, everything kind of settles down a little bit. And then we get to the last lap. Christopher Bell ends up winning the race, much like Tyler Reddick, only leads one lap, just a lap that pays, which is great for him. Austin Sender comes in second, and he dumped Harrison Burton like he was Leonardo DiCaprio and a girl just turned 25. He wanted nothing to do with him there, and the more I watch it, I was a little annoyed at Sendrick in the first place, especially if you're Ford. You have to be annoyed at Sendrick for not pushing Harrison Burton, but Harrison like did this weird little hesitant stutter step and trying to come down, and he just gave up. And Denny I Hamlin comes in third. Again, Christopher Bell started 16th. Denny Hamlin started 17th. They finished first and third. The Toyotas are fast. You can definitely move around with this package right now. And these cars are putting on a really good show. I know there's going to be guys on Dorman for Clear that are like, this is the worst super speedway package we've ever had. Everybody's riding around at half throttle. There's some strategy in that, but you can make up ground if you need to, which is a good thing. Should there be tweaks to this package? Absolutely. But it's not as bad as everybody wants to pretend that it is. John Hunter Nemechek comes home fourth in his first race with Legacy Motor Club. Harrison Burton finishes fifth after probably should have at least finished second, if not first, in this race. Zane Smith comes in sixth, his first full race for Spire in that 71 car with Trackhouse. And then you have Brad in seventh, William Byron eighth, Chase Briscoe ninth, and Justin Haley rounding out your top ten. Justin Haley with the gold wheels looks absolutely phenomenal. Black car, gold wheels, every single time you're going to get my vote for that. BJ McLeod, this is where it comes down to the transfer spot to get into the Daytona 500. It came down between BJ McLeod and Kaz Grala. Kaz Grala's in the 36 car for Front Row Motorsport. BJ McLeod driving for himself in an uncharter number 78 car since he sold that charter to Spire so that they could field the 71 car of Zane Smith. BJ's got $40 million in his pocket. Well, probably more like $10 million out of it if whatever. So BJ looked really competitive. I mean, at one point he was running in the top five. People were shoving him up towards the front. I think everybody wanted BJ to make the race. He's an all around good guy. If you haven't met BJ McLeod, nice guy in the garage area will stop and talk to you any single time. Just an all around good guy. He ends up getting shuffled back, got caught up in that wreck. And then at the end, couldn't get it done. Comes home 14th. Kaz Grala comes home 12th. I mean, we're talking about a car length separating the two of them uh, coming to the finish line that knocks BJ out of the race. 
Really unfortunate for BJ. He had Hendrick Motorsports pinning his car. He had ECR power underneath the hood. They were fast. I mean, that was the most competitive I think I've seen that 78 car look in this, you know, Gen 7 era. So great for BJ to at least have the showing. Really unfortunate that he's not in the race. Kaz Grala does lock himself into the race, which is great news for, for him. And then you have David Reagan. Sorry, completely blank there for a second. David Reagan in that third RFK car. He was locked in anyway, so he just kind of rode around. He dropped to the back early with Brad and was like, I'm not going to tear up this race car. Why bother at this point? Christian Bell wins the race, like I said. Everything else, good racing for the most part. We're going to see big accidents on Sunday. That's just something that's going to happen. These guys are shoving really hard, and this race only paid 10 points to win. Sunday pays a Harley J. Earl trophy and an automatic lock into the NASCAR playoffs. Dudes are going to be getting a little crazy out there, and I'm here for it, and I'll be there, and hopefully you guys will be too, or at least tuned in, and hopefully we get to run it on Sunday. Whether it's Sunday night, doesn't matter uh, to me. I just want it just for the rating standpoint, because running it on Monday would be really unfortunate. I'm still sticking with my pick of Brad Keselowski winning this race. I think it's finally time for him to do it. David Reagan is a great dark horse pick if you would like to do that. They had great value on FanDuel. I'm not sure what the numbers still are for them as, of course, we've now had the duels and everything like that. So people get a little bit better feel of it. But if you got in early on them, I think that's good. If you got in early on a Toyota driver, I think that's even better at this point. So like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.